Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, as always being done in the podcasting studios of our chamber champion, Czech Media Group. I would like to acknowledge, as always, that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen-speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And uh, Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union. One of the signs that we were waiting for as the pandemic was lifting was getting back to travel. Pent up demand for travel was a very real thing. And we want to talk about that today. Travel of all kinds. Kathy Scott is back with us. Kathy is the CEO, in other words, the chief exploration officer with Departures Travel. In Are you in Oak Bay or Sydney today? I'm in Oak Bay. So there's an office in Oak Bay right on the avenue and in Sydney on Beacon Avenue. So... In the big picture, Kathy, compared to pre-pandemic, has has travel sort of fully bounced forward from all of that? It really has. It's it's pretty crazy. Uh, people are traveling, I think, at unprecedented rates. Certainly, from what I'm hearing from my fellow um, people in the industry, it's really busy. Everybody's kind of crazy. Yeah, and, and so as travel is happening, are there still COVID mandates anywhere? Are there any mask issues or needs to proof of vaccination? Any of that happening anywhere in the world? There's little bits here and there, drips and drops. There are a few countries that are still requiring actually antigen tests, but not many. Philippines is one that comes to mind. Um, mostly, it's it's pretty much business as usual. People are are personally choosing to wear masks still a lot. Um, you'll find, you know, quite often there's um, a large number of mask wearers, but it, mostly it's pretty much back to normal. So when we look at, uh, the, I mean, there's been a disruption in the cost, obviously, because of all the elements of the pandemic, but people were saying, well, airlines, for example, are going to charge way more money now because they have to make up the money they lost during the pandemic. Is that true? I, I'm not sure if that's really the motivating factor. I mean, certainly... Yeah, they, they did lose a lot of money. There was a lot of uh, bailouts happening for them as well, though. Um, mostly what's happened, though, is that there are less flights still going now. And so with that, people, the pent up demand, um, it's supply and demand. They can charge more just because they can. Um, there's also the fuel issues with the with the war, you know, still going on. So that's played a factor as well. Yeah, because a lot of oil and gas comes from Ukraine and from Russia. So. Right. Uh, that's a factor. I had heard somebody also mention uh, that there's a shortage of pilots or that pilots have left the industry. Is that going on too? It really has. It's. Um, I think you'll see that across the board though with, with so many different businesses is um, the pandemic made people look at what they were doing and think, well, you know what, if I was going to retire anyway, so I'm just going to stop now. And we haven't had enough time for that funnel to be filled. And it's not like you can just hire a pilot, you know, and train them in a day. It's it's a, a multi-year um, task. And so we lost a lot of really good older pilots and they just haven't been, they haven't been replaced yet. So that is an issue. I guess a lot of them maybe have chosen to not recertify or get their license back because if you don't fly for a certain length of time, you have to do the testing all over again. That was probably a thing too. Somewhat, yeah, for sure. Um, but also, they, you know, I know for an example, Air Canada kept a lot of pilots on the payroll just because they didn't want to lose them. Um, but that could, that could only go so far. And, and a lot just decided to retire. Yeah, we're going to get to some fun stuff in a minute, but just want to go through some of these other elements. First of all, we heard about all kinds of problems in actually working your way through an airport. You know, T uh, Toronto Pearson was kind of highlighted as a, as a really bad place to fly through. Labor shortages, people not coming back to work, uh, people at entry-level positions found other things to do because their jobs went away for, for two years. Is that whole process in airports any different now? It's a lot better. And yes, it was it was a nightmare. I remember the first trip I took after, uh, well, still kind of when the pandemic was raging, uh, navigating through the airports was, uh, was an onerous task. It really was. I mean, there was less people at the gates. There was more people trying to get through. Um, but now uh, the last trip I just got back from, um, it was seamless. It was, you know, there was lots of, I, there was times when I was the first one at the gate, um, not because I was super early, just because there wasn't that many people there. So that was really nice. Hmm. Nice change to get back to that. I have a question. I don't know if you know the answer to this or not. So the baggage handlers, uh, at the airport on the ground, do they work for the airport authority or do they work for the airline? They work for the airport authority. 
In my, that's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so th- th- to go back to the process, uh, we're seeing artificial intelligence and technology is a huge part of our lives more and more and more all the time. And I actually heard somebody say that they went on a trip and the only time they ever encountered a human being was when they had their passport stamped. Do you think technology is going to be a huge factor in streamlining all of this? Absolutely. I mean, they're talking now about facial recognition being um, just the norm. So I think we're going to see that in the next couple of years for sure. Um, anytime you take people out of the equation, it can be a little bit more seamless. It also can be a problem because if something goes wrong, it's tough to, to navigate. But um, I think we'll see a lot more artificial, uh, artificial intelligence in travel. Yeah. So obviously I haven't traveled a lot <laughs> through the pandemic because I have all these questions. What, what about the, uh, the screening process? That's probably still going to involve human beings, isn't it? I think somewhat, but you know, there's a lot of pre-screening. Like I can't think of the name of what it's called. There's a, a new one for going into the states that I used the last time I went. It's an app, and and it it was it was very similar to Nexus, only it wasn't Nexus. Um, only works in the states right now, but made it very very quick for me to go through. I didn't have to talk to anybody. I just scanned my my little device um, on my phone, and away I went. Yeah, there was some huge waiting list for Nexus, right? Is that is that still a thing? Do you know? It's well, they're back up and running. They were closed in one of the uh, one or more of the areas that you could go to um, to get your Nexus card, but it's back up and running. So I think that the bottleneck will clear fairly quickly on that. Right. You know, I always, when you and I have these conversations, I always point out to people that if you're going to take a fairly long or complicated trip, it's best to work through a travel agent because you you know how to put that stuff together. And should there be anything that goes awry somehow on the trip, you're there to back them up, right? Well, for sure. I mean, that that's, and honestly, it's not me that does that for them. It's my, one of my amazing team, but um, they're, they're incredible at the knowledge that they have. And there's a lot of, travel has got more complicated and we're, that's why we're seeing such a surge of people coming in. Um, and that's, you know, not just us, it's all agencies. We're, we're all really busy. Yeah. So where is everybody traveling to? We're going to talk about that next. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Kathy Scott. She is the Chief Exploration Officer, the CEO at Departures Travel. Uh, she's in the Oak Bay office. There's also an office uh, in Sydney. Oh, you have Alberta too, right? You have something in Alberta? We do. I have a, a team in Alberta. Okay. Now then, where are people going? Because when you and I have spoken in the past, we've sort of said, well, there seems to be sort of the flavor of the year. Everybody lately has been going to Portugal and they've been going to Spain. What sort of popular choices are being made now? Or who's, who's putting themselves out there as a destination? Well, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the tourist boards are are vying for for people to come just because they've been so many have been closed down. I think one of the ones that really stands out to me right now is Japan. They're really reaching out and doing a lot of promotions, um, and it's a destination a lot of people feel very safe and comfortable going to. So it's it's becoming very big on our radar for sure. So how do you get to Japan from here? By plane. <laughs> what what are the routings? What are your options to get there? And, you know, that's a question you'd have to ask my team, because okay. I, what I will tell you is that changes almost daily. The the routing for things changes constantly. Um, you know, I know I'm right now looking to go to um, Luang Prabang and and um, the routing there. There's so many places you can you can route through. So it really depends on what's when you're going and um, where you want to stop along the way. Yeah, I guess it depends on the airline you take, too. Right. Well, of course. Yeah. yeah. Because we, you can't go anywhere directly, really, from Victoria. You, you end up going through Vancouver, and then you go to Seattle, you go to Los Angeles, you go to San Francisco. So all of that stuff being what it is. Which brings me to my next question. What are you hearing in any way about any new routes or destinations in and out of YYJ, out of our Victoria airport? Well, I wish I was hearing lots, but hmm. the reality is there is nothing new coming up that we're aware of at the moment. I mean, we always have our winter Puerto Varda and Cancun routing, but... Um, yeah, we just don't seem to be able to attract anybody else that wants to come, you know, here direct. I mean, and I was now, you know, starting to take some of the bigger planes. So maybe with more load off the island, we'll have a little more chance at getting some some um, other. I, I'd love to see some more charters to sun destinations that we used to have years ago, but not, not right now. Yeah, I had an opportunity to uh, be in a meeting not long ago with the CEO of WestJet, who was in town to meet with tourism stakeholders and other people. Um, and we asked him directly about that, about other routes going to other markets, specifically in the United States, for us to have connections through. And he made it pretty clear that their priority right now is domestic and domestic travel. 
a uh, question we've always asked, and you've probably been asked this, why can't we fly directly from here into Palm Desert? Into It's called Bob Hope Airport, actually. The reason being, they don't have customs. You have to go through somewhere else to enter the United States. But yeah, we'll keep an eye, because there used to be a route to San Francisco from here, I believe, too. And it was great. It was such a, yeah, it was such a good one for us because we, well, we have cruise lines and whatnot, but it's, it was also a good jumping off point. So yeah, we're, we're hopeful. I mean, we are an international airport. We just don't get a lot of international travel yet. Yeah. Um, in the world of air travel, there's a growing fleet of discount airlines, which I don't fully have my head around quite yet. Um, I'd mentioned to you that I, I have to go to Calgary for something later on this year. And I found an airfare that was like $38 return or something. What's what's the story behind the discount airlines? How can they do that and why do they do that? Well, I you know, it's it's unbundled. So basically you you don't a lot of them you don't even get a carry-on bag. If you want a carry-on bag, you pay for it. Um so that that is a lot. I mean, for business travel, it can be good. Um to be perfectly frank, we don't sell a lot of them because they come and go. And and that's a problem for us. You know, our clients need to know that they're going to be able to get somewhere and that it's not going to be canceled when they get to the airport and they're standing at the gate. And that happens a lot with the, with the discount carriers. So we're really careful about it. Um, having said that, I think that it's a great service when, the, when they work. Yeah. We have had the conversation over the last 10 years about rail, rail travel, rail traffic on Vancouver Island, which has now gone away. But we talk about airlines and, and flying to holidays. Do people still take the train to places? Yeah, in Europe, it's incredibly popular. Um, and and through COVID, of course, um, a lot of the smaller airlines were closing down over there, and it was the only way to get around. I was over last year and um, did some rail travel, and it's just seamless. It's so, so wonderful and one beautiful way to see the, the country. Um, and then, of course, there's a new Rocky Mountaineer down in Colorado. We have our Rocky Mountaineer here that does, you know, right through to Banff and, and the Rockies. Um, they've just opened a brand new one down there and it's just stunning. So that's that's really great. But rail travel, we've got our across Canada. And, and I think it's something we don't think often enough about, but it's a really great way of experiencing our own country. Yeah, you just, I, I have personally have not heard a lot of people say, yeah, I'm going to take a train trip. I'm going to take the train to Toronto or someplace else or go to the States and use Amtrak to get someplace. I guess it, it really is a European and an Asian thing more than more than it is with us, right? It is. And it's unfortunate because it's a really great way to experience our world. It's, you know, it's, it's safe, it's reliable, um, it's comfortable, and you, the, the views are incredible. So I think it's something we need to look at a little bit more. Yeah, I, I've, I've done a train trip through Europe as well. I went from uh, Paris to Florence uh, through the Alps, which was amazing, and did some other little trips around. But yeah, those are those are things we'll we'll keep an eye on for that. Um, I want to talk about some specific regions now as we get into the fun stuff about travel. So you mentioned Europe. Let's start with Europe. What sort of things are happening in Europe? Are there new adventures available now? Well, I think that um, people are tending to go off the beaten track a little bit. I mean, we talked a little bit about your travel to Italy and how you're now going to go more to um, to the northern Italy mm -hmm. this time, the next time you go, instead of a little bit more mainstream. And we're finding people doing that. I think people are looking for uncrowded destinations still. And so instead of going to the, the um, big iconic places, they're tending to go to the little bit more small um, boutique areas. I think Croatia is becoming really popular, Estonia, um, you know, any of those sorts of destinations are are becoming very popular. Uh, yeah, Montenegro, I guess, is in that list of people mm -hmm. too that are doing it. What about, yeah. what, do you hear much about Scandinavia? It's popular. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's, it's popular more in... Um, in longer, longer trips, people are going and they're wanting to do multi-countries and it's, yeah, it's a great place. Yeah. Amanda and I are working with your team, of course, to, to book a trip that we have coming up. So we've decided that we're going to go to Copenhagen, which we had never really thought about in the past. But the more research you do on it, it's it's pretty cool place, isn't it? It's very cool. The, the history that we as North Americans don't have, really. I mean, we've got such a short history here, but you go to anywhere in Europe. Um, it's incredible. We see people are also traveling, of course, for family reasons. And we have a lot of people in this region that are their heritage is in the British Isles. So that's mm -hmm. that's pretty popular, too, I would think. Right. It is. And also, there's been so many movies. That oh, yeah. Really, you know, crazy. The amount of movies that have come out in, in such a small space. When you actually look at it on the world scene, how small, physically small. Yeah. Um, 
and yet the, the amount of movies that have come out of it and so the people wanting to go there and experience what they're seeing on tv is is crazy yeah no kidding uh you mentioned that you're taking a trip to asia um to some uh you're going to Lao, you said and to i'm sorry is it Viet not vietnam you're going to and thailand thailand yeah. right thailand, yeah uh, that's always been popular, right? Is there anything, we'll talk about the, the good old stuff first, but or, or later rather, but is there anything new? Are there new destinations in Asia that are popping up or becoming more popular? Well, I think some of the tried and true ones like Thailand, which I'm going to, people are, again, they're not going into the mainstream, you know, of course you fly into Bangkok, but they're going into maybe up more into Chiang Mai, um, some of the smaller communities and experiencing those destinations. Lao uh, or Laos, however you want to say it, um, which I'm also going to, is is one that's really up and coming. It's one of the most pretty of the Asian countries, and probably the the one of the least visited, and yet becoming quite popular with those that are tra well traveled um, as a destination to go to and see something really unique. Hmm. So, for would you fly in and out of Bangkok for both of those destinations? For Leo as well. Okay. Of course, we have lots of people here whose heritage is so, heritage rather is South Asian and India, Bangladesh, places like that. That travel is always fun, I'll bet. Well, I think a lot do because of their families. You're right. They're, re, they're going and they're checking out their heritage. Are we getting along with China these days? Is there much travel to China? We're not getting a lot of people requesting China. I think it's, I think people are still nervous. Okay. Uh, we've got some other places to talk about in the world as we continue to travel with Kathy Scott. We'll do that again in just a moment. Kathy Scott is our guest today on Chamber Chats. She is the uh, uh, Chief Exploration Officer, CEO of Departures Travel in Oak Bay and in Sydney, as well as in uh, Alberta. So, Africa. Let's talk about Africa. You've been to Africa. I'm going back to Africa. Uh, th that's just a whole spectrum of experiences on that continent, right? It really is. And it's, I mean, you, you look at the, if from the top when you're looking at Morocco and Egypt, and then you look all the way down to, um, South Africa, it's, it's completely varied and every country is so different. So Africa, if you never went anywhere else, but Africa, you would, you, you still couldn't experience it all. There's also places in the world that we like to keep our eye on because there are some bad things happening. We mentioned the war in Ukraine, of course, so that part of the world is kind of out of it. Sudan is having some troubles right now. So it's it's obviously smart to do travel that doesn't involve going to those high risk areas, right? Well, for sure. And there's lots of good, there's lots of better choices right now, for sure. Uh, where else have you been in Africa? Oh my gosh. Um, I've been to Tunisia. I just got back from uh, Phenomenal uh, gorilla trek in Uganda, which was life changing. Um, I, and I, got, I did also Kenya and Tanzania while I was there. Um, so, yeah, I've been to South Africa. Uh, beautiful. You absolutely love it. I, I know you've been there before, but you know, can't, you can't uh, go too many times. Um, and I'll be back. There's lots of other places I still want to go. There's probably people watching this right now that kind of think that trips like that are not within their comfort zone. But it's, and I, I, what's that perception, do you think? Like, how do you, how do you speak with people who say, well, I'd rather stay on the safe path. I don't want to try anything. You know, there's great value in looking at these other places, right? Well, and I think that it, it does depend on the person's comfort level. Like it's, some people even at home are more comfortable doing things that are a little bit more dynamic than other people. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. I think though, Africa, um, you know, what I would say is if you're nervous about going somewhere like that, just make sure you're doing it on a tour where there's people taking care of you the whole time. I certainly, even as a well-traveled person, wouldn't just go wing it. I, I definitely would have it planned out well in advance and know who I'm, where I'm staying, who I'm working with, um, that I've got guides taking care of me on the ground. And it's incredibly comfortable there. They, they really do put a lot of time and energy and money into their tourism. So it's it's a wonderful place to go. Yeah, you know, some, some place that's never been on my radar at all, and I don't I don't know why, but every time I think about it, I think I should probably change my mind on it. South America. I've never really thought that would be a place I would go. It's probably amazing, uh, but what's that experience like? Well, I hadn't been to South America until a couple of years ago, and now all of a sudden, I don't know, whatever for whatever reason, I've been to multi-places. Um, mm. And I started with an um, Antarctica, and that was just outstanding. Um, but I, I loved South America. I, I love the people, the warmth, the food is incredible. I was just in, uh, not long ago, I was in Peru. And I have to say the Peruvian food is 
the best I've had in the world. And I've had a lot of good food. Yeah. It was, it was absolutely incredible. Um, but just the topography and the, the history and the culture, it's, it's really, it's an amazing country in every, um, every single country within South America are, are very diverse. So I think, I think you should revisit that. Yeah. Someday. We'll send yeah. you down with us. <laughs> okay. I think we should talk about that. It's also just lack of knowledge, right? There's places that you have an interest in and you'll read up on them or research them. So I will do that uh, for sure about uh, about South America. Um, Australia and New Zealand have always been a very comfortable spot for Canadian travelers too, right? Because there's no, there's no language barrier, that whole Commonwealth connection, that kind of stuff. Lots of that going on, I guess. Yeah, people are really, I think there's a lot of family. People have a lot of family in, in uh, both New Zealand and Australia and not seeing them for three years, it, 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 they're going. Um, we are seeing those destinations as being, people don't go there for two weeks. If they're gonna go, they're gonna go for a month. And so that is something to think about. Um, if you're planning it someday, get it on your calendar and make sure you've got lots of time. But it's, yeah, very popular. And I guess something that's more of an adventure is a polar trip, the North Pole, the South Pole. Do you see much of that these days? It's total bucket list travel and everybody is excited about it right now. We, we've sold more of the Antarctica and the Arctic expeditions in the last couple of years than we have in the entire time I've been in the industry. Um, I think people, again, you know, pent up demand. They, it's Those are not the easiest of trips to get to typically. So, you know, you have to do some planning around them. And I think people just think, well, if, if not now, when? So they're planning them. It's great. And we touched on rail travel a while ago. Let's not ever overlook the fact that Canada is full of amazing experiences. It's a huge country. And there's so many corners of this country that many of us have not yet to explore. Are there any kind of unique Canadian experiences that have come along lately that you've heard about? Well, I think one of the tourist boards and um, areas that have really, uh, really done a great job is the Yukon. Mm -hmm. And um, they're they're doing big things up in the Yukon. They've got some great new travel product up there. Um, and, you know, things like Northern Lights and sled dog dogging and that sort of thing. People are just loving it. And it's Canadian. But I've also done the um, Arctic expedition the, through the Canadian Arctic. And, and it was just a phenomenal experience. And being with the Inuit people and um, seeing the way that they live. We do have an incredibly diverse country and amazing travel opportunities. So you don't really have to go anywhere else if you don't want to. Yeah, there you go. Canada first. We have all the climates. We've got it all going on. So, you know, when we touch on things that might be outside your comfort zone, maybe think about that when you're going to plan your travel, get an ex uh, a professional like Kathy's team at Departures to help you find something that suits your sense of adventure somewhere in the world. And don't forget to check out Canada too. Kathy Scott, thank you for your time today. Always great to see you. Thank you for having me again. Always a pleasure. Yeah, Kathy Scott is the Chief Exploration Officer with Departures Travel in Oak Bay and in Sydney and in Alberta. And I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chats.